hydrogen bomb weighing over 20 tons. It has an explosion the size of 1.2 million tons of TNT, making it one of the deadliest bombs known to man. It is so powerful, in fact, that if one was detonated in Detroit, the effects would be felt all the way to Canton. But why was this bomb constructed? And why would anybody need a bomb as powerful as this one? These are questions that would take us down a long and unknown journey through time, from the beginnings of Hiroshima to the deadliest arms race known to man. This is The Super. We begin on August 6th, 1945. Hiroshima, Japan, 8.14 in the morning. The sun began to rise above the city as it always had for over three and a half centuries. The people of Hiroshima were waking up to the start of the new week of work and school. However, none of them knew that they only had a minute left to live. After the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th, Japan surrendered to the US and ended the Second World War. The nukes dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed over 200,000 people both having the power of 20,000 tons of TNT. This was the first and still to this day the only time nuclear warfare has been used during war. America was now the unrivaled superpower of the world, but that title would soon be put into question a few years later. During the war, the Soviet Union fought on the same side as the Allies in defeating Germany. And even though both sides supported opposing political and economic views, they were considered to be on good terms. Of course, this did not stop Stalin from spying on their allies. Harriet Truman told Stalin about the U.S.'s atomic bombs, but Stalin already knew, as he had had spies in the U.S.'s intelligence since 1944, with Klaus Fuchs, a physicist who worked in Los Alamos, assisting in the bomb building project for the United Kingdom. Of course, Stalin was still not pleased that the U.S. had this much power over the world. He wanted the USSR to hold the same power, if not more, than what the U.S. held. And so, by the summer of 1949, the Soviets officially made their own nuclear bomb. The construction of the Soviets' own atomic bomb would end up evening the playing field between the two superpowers and would be one of the beginning causes of the Cold War. America's involvement in World War II changed many Americans' perspectives on foreign policy. Before the war, Americans wanted nothing to do with the outside world and advocated for isolationism. However, after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, many Americans decided that America should get involved in world affairs. This, as well as the end of the war, would be the main contributing factors into America's second Red Scare. During the 1940s, many Americans became suspicious of the Soviets and communism, especially after many Soviet spy defectors revealed to the public the Soviet spy ring across the American intelligence. This theory against communism would be fueled further by the Truman Doctrine, where Harry Truman said the U.S. would do what it can to contain the spread of communism. This would not stop the Soviets, however, from continuing to fight against capitalism and to spread communism. With the Cold War starting, the question remained, when and where would the next conflict be, and will the U.S. and USSR use nukes to win the conflict? That would be answered shortly with the Korean War. Kim Il-sung, with the full backing of Stalin and the Soviet Union, would invade South Korea on June 25, 1950. At first, both sides decided against using nuclear warfare, even as the Allies began to push North Korea towards its northern border. That was until China, wanting to keep North Korea as a buffer state between itself and the West, sent half a million troops right into North Korea. Douglas MacArthur, the US general in charge of the Korean War, suggested using nukes on the Chinese troops. Although he kept pushing Truman to nuke China, he was eventually fired as the US didn't want to use their atomic bombs as it wasn't too long ago when the Soviets made their own. With the Soviets posing a huge threat to the US and its goals for world freedom, the US would decide to start creating a new nuke, one the atomic bomb would pale in comparison to, and would surely give the US the upper hand over the Soviets. In October of 1949, the Atomic Energy Commission scientists needed to make a firm decision on whether they should develop the H-bomb or not. They finally asked Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. He said that the H-bomb was the best way to protect America, but they needed more feedback. 
so for two days they asked their members what they should do. After those two days, they decided that uranium plutonium stores should be bought for the production on more atomic bombs instead of the H-bomb because they said it would be really unstable and cause havoc on any place they drops on. Even after saying that, they still decided to develop the H-bomb. They finally finished it in 1951 and they planned to test a year after. October 31st, 1952, they detonated their first H-bomb called the Mike Test on a small island apart from Inuit Watak Atoll. This island was taken by Japan from the US during World War II to be used as a nuclear testing site. As for the people, they were moved elsewhere to avoid any casualties. After this, they decided to test more bombs on the island. On March 1st, 1954, the Bravo bomb was shot. It was as powerful as 15 megatons, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb that hit Hiroshima. It was the largest bomb test in the world. It completely changed the scientists' minds because of how successful they were on creating a nuclear weapon. After the Soviets caught wind of what America was doing through their spy network, they decided to develop their own H-bomb. Just a few days after the US dropped their first H-bomb, the Soviet spy Levente Barrera asked his scientists how their layer cake was doing. The layer cake was the Soviets designed for the first H-bomb and consists of opposing layers containing light elements like tritanium and deuteranium, with the only heavy layers being the isotope for uranium. A person who worked the most on H-bomb, who is also considered to be the father of the H-bomb, was Andrei Sakharov. He is a Soviet physicist who was very excited to make the H-bomb, ever since the dropping of the atomic bomb. They recruited him to work on the bomb in the summer of 1948. Since they were going through with making the H-bomb, they decided to expand their facilities in order to help the production of the H-bomb. Before they finished their H-bomb, the US came to Russia so that they would both stop producing nuclear weapons. But Russia quickly ignored them and continued production of their H-bomb. Less than a year after the drop of the first H-bomb from the US, Russia dropped their first H-bomb on August 12, 1953 on an island called Bikini. The construction of hydrogen bombs led to what is now known as the arms race. This was a nuclear arms race where both the US and the USSR would try to create more nuclear weapons than one another, as well as making the bombs more destructive. These new dangerous hydrogen bombs almost proved costly to the US on January 24, 1961, when a B-52 carrying two W-39 hydrogen bombs crashed in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Although none of the bombs went off, the incident showed the US how careful they had to be with these new weapons. Nine months later, on October 30th, the USSR would detonate the largest bomb ever created, the Tsar Bomba, detonated on the island Novaya Zemlya. It had an explosion on the size of 50 million tons of TNT. This explosion was so big that glass windows shattered all the way to Sweden. Even though there was no bomb ever made to be powerful than this one, the true climax of the arms race would come a year later on October 16, 1962, with the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a 13-day long proxy war between the U.S. and the USSR that began when Soviet missiles were located in Cuba by U.S. spy planes. Tensions between the two powers were at an all-time high, and it is believed that this was most likely a chance throughout the whole Cold War where the world was on the verge of nuclear warfare. Luckily, however, on October 29th, the US and the USSR made an agreement where the Soviets will remove their missiles from Cuba if the US removes their missiles from Turkey. Through the crisis, both the US and the USSR realized the level of their immense strength, and for the rest of the Cold War, they decided to only aid foreign nations who supported their interest. The hydrogen bomb played a vital role in the early days of the Cold War. Due to its immense power and its destructive capabilities, it enabled the US and Soviets to jumpstart their nuclear arms race, which would last until 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. What started as an idea to end World War II turned into the first nuclear arms race known to man, in which the world would be brought multiple times to the brink of nuclear destruction.